Ladies and gentlemen, today on the program... The JHP Digital Broadcasting Company proudly presents the final episode of the John Huff Podcast 2020 season, which is definitely not sponsored by Lucky Strike Cigarettes. On behalf of your preferred podcast distribution service, welcome to this special presentation. Your broadcast affiliate also wishes you the very best of the holiday season, with fond wishes for warm cockles and a minimum of online social anxiety. So if you're ready, gather around your digital listening device and definitely do not light up a Lucky Strike cigarette. And now, here's your humble host, John Huff, who is also definitely not lighting up a Lucky Strike cigarette. Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's December 22nd, 2020. And your new Mr. Olympia bodybuilding champion is Mamdu LSBA, better known as Big Rammy. I know you don't follow professional bodybuilding, okay? And I know, looking at me, you wouldn't think that I do either. But I do, kids. A little bit, off and on. And this is the legacy of the 90s, when I was a high school and university student. Spent a lot of time in the gymnasium, trying to get some muscles. And I got caught up kind of in the pro bodybuilding world, man. It was a fun place to be back in the 90s. They called it the second golden era. The first golden era, of course, being the 1970s. Arnold and Franco and Frank Zane and Ed Corny. Lou Ferrigno. Danny Padilla. Padilla, Padilla, Padilla. The giant killer. Tom Platts with those legs. The 1970s, man. California beaches and the sunshine. Second golden era was the 1990s, and I'm not sure why. Except to say that there were, in those days, a whole series of legends competing at the same time, at the highest levels of pro bodybuilding, okay? You had Flex Wheeler and Kevin LeVron and Paul DeLette, all competing at the same time. And as great as they were, they all fell to the shadow. And the shadow was Dorian Yates, man. Dorian Yates was an English bodybuilder, very quiet, very stoic, trained in Birmingham in a gym called Temple Gym that I think actually exists or existed in black and white. Like, I think it wasn't the photos. I think the gym was actually black and white. So you had all these cats over in California where the bodybuilding media was centered and where Gold's Gym was, you know, and where Arnold and Franco had made that the epicenter of the bodybuilding universe. And all these guys were there training in the sunshine with their bikini girls. And all the way across the world was Dory in the shadow, looming. And it was the 90s, man, so you didn't have up to the second social media. You couldn't track what this dude was up to. But you could guess that he was working harder than anyone. (laughs) Dorian did not have the same shape, the same kind of genetic structure and gifts that some of the other guys had, your flex wheelers, etc. But he had an unshakable work ethic and an almost psychotic devotion to the craft of bodybuilding. And he would just turn up, man, you know? The contest would be happening, and all the the California dudes had been training together all year long. They knew what they were looking like. And then the shadow would just appear bigger than everyone, and he set the world on fire. 1993, Dorian won... Six Mr. Olympia titles in the 90s, okay? Mr. Olympia being the Super Bowl of bodybuilding, okay? And he won his first in 1992, following a run of eight by the great Lee Haney. And Lee Haney was kind of a bridge between the first golden era and the second, all right? 
What you notice between those two eras is a substantial difference in size of these bodybuilders, okay? And I'm not going to go into all the details on that because you probably don't care. But the 90s guys were much bigger than the 70s guys. And Lee Haney was kind of the bridge between the 70s aesthetic and the 90s size. And Dorian took that to levels never seen before. 1993, I think it was, Dorian released a series of black and white photographs of himself that still dropped jaws, okay? Nobody had ever seen the level of density and muscle that this cat had put on his body. And that was my era, man, the Dorian era, where I was paying attention to bodybuilding and I was in the gym all the time, trying my best, man, to put some size on this skinny little frame of mine. And you're asking yourself right now, why is the dude talking about this, man? And the answer is, Big Rammy won the show. Now, this is not Hot Friday Night, kids, all right? Now, I did an episode on Hot Friday Night, and I decided to scrap it. And I'll tell you a little bit about that shortly. But you know, the show must go on, right? So you scrap your Friday night. Sunday morning, you get up, you put on your suit, and you put on your tie, and you button it up, and you sit down at your mic. So that's what I've done. And the luxury about that is that the Mr. Olympia finals were last night, and so I got to see who won, and Big Rammy won his first Mr. Olympia last night, defeating Phil Heath, who returned from a short exile trying to take number eight to tie Ronnie Coleman, to tie Lee Haney. And... That's interesting. You know, that's compelling. That's dramatic. The point is, Big Rammy's been kicking around the top of the ladder for a long time, all right? And this guy is a freak among freaks. And that is a compliment, okay? That is not an insult in the bodybuilding world. The best thing you can call somebody is a freak, okay? And Rammy came up and he had been training for like three years and put on like a hundred pounds of muscle. That is genetics beyond genetics, man. This dude's capability for building and maintaining and carrying muscle is off the freaking charts. And so rumor went around of this giant coming out of the Middle East. And then Rami popped up at the 2013, probably the New York Pro, I want to say, his first professional show. And people went, what? Because he was beyond, man. Now we had seen big dudes before. You know, Ronnie Coleman, 300 pounds on stage. Even Dorian and Nasser El Sambadi and some of these dudes who are Marcus Rule, like these guys who are otherworldly. And Rami was in that kind of, you know, that kind of space. We hadn't really seen a lot of that for a while. You know, Phil was, Phil was a much smaller guy, looked like a cartoon, but smaller, maybe 240 on stage. Rami's coming in 285, 290 on stage ripped. We're talking single digit body fat percentage like low single digit you know two three four percent freak man freak of nature and so everybody was like that dude's mr olympia but he could not dial it in on contest day all right now these guys do not walk around at two three four percent body fat all year long because they die and so they got to dial it in for the night of the pre-judging which is usually friday and the show the finals on saturday so they got to build their whole year to this peak, this two-day peak. And Rami kept coming in huge, just dwarf everybody on the stage, but not quite hit the conditioning, you know? Not quite hit the body fat percentage that you need to win one of these shows. And so he'd place in the top five, you know, and he'd be around it and he'd be close, but not quite there. And Phil would win or Sean Roden would win, you know? Brandon Curry won last year, okay. There's always Rami kicking around. This guy who is beyond everyone in terms of sheer physical size. Rami's thighs are beyond description. <laughs> I can't describe them. It's, it's insane how much muscle this guy carries. And a lot of people think that's disgusting, and that's okay. You know, not everything's for everyone, kids. And so we come up to this contest... And Rami's flying a little bit under the radar. And it's COVID's weird and some people couldn't go. And nobody's paying a whole lot of attention to Rami because we've seen him come up four or five of these contests. 
the Mr. Olympia and not quite get there, not quite have it. So people are like, man, if Rami ever dials it in, that dude is going to be unbeatable. But he never quite did. And so we come up to this, this sh show last night on the weekend, and everybody's talking about the return of Phil Heath going for his record-tying eighth Mr. Olympia win. And they're talking about Brandon Curry, who won it last year and is kind of the new guy. And it's all about that. Nobody's paying a lot of attention to Big Rammy. And then they come out Friday night pre-judging. And one by one they come out and they do a little posing routine. Everybody gets their first look. And, you know, Brandon Curry looks good. Phil Heath looks good. There's critiques here and there. There's other guys that look good. And then Rami just thunders out onto the stage. The Rami that everybody's been waiting to see. Huge, full, ripped, shredded. Rami finally nailed it. Rami finally looks like everyone imagined Rami could look. And a ripple goes through the bodybuilding world. Is this the year? Has Rami finally done it? And the answer to that is yes, kids. Rami finally did it. And that's the point. Incremental improvement over time. Rami's just an illustration of what happens if you remain focused on your craft. Keep believing. Don't stop believing. And you make those incremental improvements over time. So this guy made his pro debut in 2013. Seven years later, he's coming to the peak. And that's what bodybuilding is, man. Bodybuilding is a long game. Bodybuilding is a game of patience. You know, a game of micro decisions. A game of slow accumulation. And if you can imagine 2013, this dude's already 300 pounds. It's like, how much bigger can you get? How much better can you get? But you can. You chip away at it, man, a little bit over time. Dial in your diet a bit in 2014. See what that does. Dial it in a bit in 2015. See how much better you can get. Try a different thing in 2016. You know what I'm saying? To keep making incremental improvements over time. And then when the moment comes, when the opportunity is there, you're ready to seize it, man. 2020 comes in. Phil's not quite what he was. You know, Brandon Curry's good, but the door is open for someone to be a little bit better. And Rami finally nails it. The absolute giant dwarfs everybody on that stage. Wins himself the Super Bowl of bodybuilding. And that's on my mind these days, kids, because I told you that I recorded Friday night an episode that I eventually decided to shelve. Just wasn't feeling it. But part of that episode was an acknowledgement that I would be releasing it on the 22nd of December, 2020. Why does that matter? Because exactly one year before, on December 22nd, 2019, I was in a hotel room in Fort Erie, Ontario, recording a road episode with Ken the Zen and Denny Boy. Having just played a Christmas show, a private Christmas function with the Sarah Smith Band, and we were having a bottle of wine and we were doing a road episode. You can hear this not realizing that that was the last show we would play together, the four of us. Didn't know that at the time, but a month later we were going to start hearing rumors of something called the coronavirus. And that coronavirus was going to shut down music and shut down us. So two tours in Europe canceled, another whack of shows in the summer that the four of us were going to play together. You know, we didn't know exactly one year ago today, if you're listening on release day, that that was going to be the end, man, for a while, maybe forever, who knows? And that's a profound thing to think about how much the world can change in a year, man. And I talked a lot about that on the episode that I shelved, but I didn't say anything really new. So I'm just going to leave that. But what's compelling is that in prepping for the episode that I shelved, I went back and listened to part of that road episode because I wanted to remember what wine we were drinking because I thought maybe I'd like some of that for your New Year's Eve. 
And I listened to the intro that I put on that episode and immediately wanted to take down the first 30 episodes of this program. Was not good, man. I was listening to it like, I released this. Not the rotisode part, just the intro, just the me part of all this, okay? It was like, wow, man. Not good. I had not developed an idiom yet, okay? I was still kind of fumbling around with the extended intros, and I hadn't even done a solo episode yet. How much have things changed just with the show, man? I didn't do my first solo episode until January 2nd of this year. I thought it was January 2nd, 2019. But it's such a weird freaking time warp anymore. It was actually this year, 2020. Not that long ago. So you think about 2019 to 2020, December 22nd, how radically this show has changed, just in terms of format. And a thank you for sticking with me. But just looking at my performance on the early episodes to now is embarrassing. A little bit humiliating. Almost don't want to tell you about it in case you go back and listen, but if you do, I want you to take a little bit of encouragement from it, okay? Because I'm trying to. In the realization that incremental improvements over time get you to a Mr. Olympia. And I've realized in listening to the older episodes and some of the early solo episodes just how radically things have improved. Not the finished article yet. Maybe I'm Rami 2016. <laughs> still experimenting, you know, still trying to dial in that body fat. But better, but better, okay? Incremental improvement over time. And Rami is the illustration, man. Rami is the evidence. And I'm trying to use that as encouragement for myself and for you. I'm humble enough to say, go listen to some of my earlier episodes. I reckon you'll be shocked by just how much more comfortable I am on the mic now, just how much more personality has come into this show, and this is all about practice, man. It's not even a conscious thing. It's just sitting down and grinding out episodes and getting a little more comfortable, getting a little more confident, developing just a little bit of swagger. I did like an arm move. I did like a, like a breakdancey, flowy arm move when I said that. I'm over here dancing on my stool, man, which I didn't used to do in the early days. I should probably be YouTubing this. Apparently that's popular. So my message is simply to look at Big Rammy, think about incremental improvement over time. Look at your humble host in this podcast, think about incremental improvement over time, and look at what it is you're trying to do, or thinking about starting in 2021. Because we're coming up to resolution time, kids. And maybe you're looking at losing some weight or starting a project or learning an instrument or training for a different job, or painting, something like that, taking photographs, indulging a hobby that you haven't really before. And you're reluctant because you're going to suck at it. You don't want to suck at it. It's okay. Remember Rami. Remember your humble host. With everything anybody does, there is a process of evolution and growth and getting better, right? You cannot avoid that process. And so the sooner you begin, the sooner you get through that process. I knocked out like 40 episodes of this show that I'm not super happy with. Interviews were great, you know, and the interviewees were great. I'm talking about my comfort on the mic and me focusing what this show is, which I'm still doing, by the way. It takes time, but you must go through this process no matter what you're doing. So begin and take your lumps and be bad at it for a while. And don't dial in your body fat percentage for a while and miss it on contest day for a while. But keep making those improvements, man. And then in a year, or two years or five years, whatever, depends on what you're trying to do. Eventually you'll realize you've gotten better. And that's what it's all about, kids. You know, people are happier when they're improving at something, when they're trying to improve at something. So with 2021 looming like the shadow, think about incremental improvement over time. Don't compare yourself 
you know, to a week ago. Compare yourself to a year ago. Sometimes the changes are so subtle that you don't notice them happening. Then you go back and you listen to your first solo sode, which you think was probably the best episode you've done. And then you're like, "Uh uh-oh, well, that's not nearly as good as I remember it. And you fast forward and listen to maybe number 57, and you're like, much better. More personality, more charisma, more charm, more flow, man. You know, more vibe. Takes time. But if you don't do all the episodes in between, you don't get there. So with 2021 looming, resolution time ahead, remember, man, incremental improvements, okay? So this is going to be a shorter episode than I've been doing, all right? Because we're sneaking up on the Christmas, and I already did a whole episode on Hot Friday Night that I dropped. There's a precedent for that, you know. I mean, I've got several episodes recorded that I've never released, because there's just something missing. Whether it's a flow thing or an energy thing or whatever, I listen back to them. Usually after I'm done recording, I know I might have a problem. I see those red flags, you know, in my in my third eye. And when I got done recording that one, I thought, eh, there was just something about the flow of that thing and what I talked about. It just didn't work for me. And I tried my best to edit it into shape. And it just didn't go into shape for me, man. Just couldn't get those corners square, you know what I'm saying? So I decided to drop it. And I've done that before. And sometimes you just got to do that. There's a precedent. In the music world, I went looking. Apparently, Green Day had a record called Cigarettes and Valentines that they were ready to do before they dropped American Idiot and something happened where they lost the tracks or something and they just like scrapped it, done, we're going to start something else. And along comes American Idiot, which was the resurrection of Green Day, if they had ever actually gone away. One of the biggest albums of the last, whatever it is, 20, 30 years. Apparently, Weezer had one, Songs from the Black Hole that they shelved, you know, went on to something different. Apparently, Beyonce dropped 50 tunes for a record she was putting together. 50 songs! She's like, nah, this ain't right, man. Let's start over again. Jimi Hendrix, Black Gold, apparently. I don't know much about that, but apparently before Jimi died, there was a record. Then they decided to shelve it. The Weeknd, apparently. Guns N' Roses apparently had something called The General that they scrapped. So there's a precedent, you know, for creating a thing and then just not releasing it. Because you know, you know as an artist, if you can call me that, you know when you haven't hit the mark, man. You know when whatever you're doing just ain't quite on. So I dropped Hot Friday Night's episode. And I don't feel too bad about that because I got a bunch of them. That I've dropped and... You know, I wanted to do something just a little bit tighter. I wanted to be more articulate about fewer things. And then Big Ramy won the Mr. Olympia. And incidentally, you know, following up on Dorian Yates, he's an interesting dude, man. Now, he left bodybuilding at the end of the 90s, had so many injuries that he just couldn't maintain the level anymore. And then he went into a depression, as you would, because you dedicate 15 or 20 years of your life to this one thing and become the best in the world at it, and then it's gone. And who are you after that, man? Who are you anymore? So he went on this really crazy journey of depression and recovery, plant medicine, ayahuasca. And now Dorian's a very public figure. Go look at interviews with Dorian Yates about consciousness, about spirituality, about mysticism. He is an interesting dude. And he runs like plant medicine retreats and stuff. He's really, really interesting. So go look up interviews with Dorian Yates. Anytime in the past, maybe five, six years, you know, there's a lot to be learned there. There's a lot of wisdom happening with that guy about ego. I mean, bodybuilding is as egoic a pursuit as you can pursue. Not necessarily egoic in terms of arrogance, but egoic in terms of, you know, response and feedback and total devotion to one's self, total focus on one's self, not the higher self, the egoic self. 
Dorian had to lose all that, man, and the ayahuasca helped open that up for him, opened up his eyes, you know, all three of them. And so go listen to some interviews with Dorian. If you're looking for sort of a connection to consciousness, you know, if you're feeling something inside, if your cockles are crying out for some sort of inspiration, some sort of spiritual message, go listen to Dorian. Very, very interesting stuff. Anyways, I'm aiming to keep this shorter than I've been doing some other ones because I burned myself out a little bit on hot Friday night. But something else really good happened, man, and I'm going to make a weird connection here. It's going to seem strange. But last week, at long, long freaking last, the most recent, the newest episode, the newest special of The Grand Tour was released, all right? A massive hunt. I don't know if you know The Grand Tour or not, okay? But... This is one of my favorite programs, and these three guys who run the Grand Tour are three of my favorite TV people. Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond, James May. And these guys were, for like 20 years, the driving force, no pun intended, behind the car show Top Gear, all right? Ran on the BBC, one of the most popular shows on the BBC, and made these guys international stars. And they'd be like driving through Italy or the Swiss Alps or something, in Bugattis, <laughs> you know, in Ferraris and whatever, you know, driving these amazing supercars that you can't even buy and put on the highway. And it was just a really compelling show. Now, I'm not a car guy, right, at all. Never been a car guy. You know about the Burgundy fade. That's my level of car guy, okay? And I just enjoy these presenters so much that I watched the show and I got hooked, not so much on Top Gear. Now, Top Gear ran forever on the BBC and then there was a dust up between the hosts and the BBC. More specifically, Jeremy Clarkson, I think, slugged somebody <laughs> behind the scenes on the set. And they wound up firing Clarkson and Hammond and May decided they would leave the BBC. And then Amazon came along. The timing was perfect, kids. Just like I said about 2020, sometimes you lose things you need to lose, you know, in order to make room for something else. Amazon, by that point, had Prime going and streaming was like a real thing and there was money. And Amazon came along and said, hey, Clarkson, May and Hammond, let's give you a show on Amazon. So they created the Grand Tour, which is very much like Top Gear. So they talk a lot of cars. And they race a lot of cars, right? Some really exotic stuff. And then they do... I'm not doing the show justice, okay? There's a lot of hijinks. There's a lot of wacky stuff. And these guys would be filming all over the world, man. Doing these weird pursuits and contests. And exploring different parts of the world. It was part travel show, you know? Part travel show, part car show. And then they'd just do lunatic stuff. And dangerous stuff, man. They'd be driving cars across like these rickety wooden bridges, you know, 100 feet up in the air in who knows where, Costa Rica or someplace. Really compelling and really kind of dramatic stuff and really funny too at times because it's, it's all lunacy, right? It's all madness. And the hosts are always bickering and arguing with each other and a lot of it's staged and I get that, it's television. But I really like the hosts and it became as though they were friends of mine, you know? So they did, I think, three seasons of the Grand Tour and they had this tent... And they'd put an audience in the tent, and they'd do the thing, and they'd interview some people. And it was fun, man. It was a, it was a lot of fun to watch the show. Then they decided to cancel the tent and the audience and just focus on doing these specials, okay? So hour and a half specials, you know, one-offs, right? And they dropped one like a year ago called Seaman, tee where they were on like riverboats and stuff and doing these, these quests and competitions against each other. Really compelling stuff and funny and dangerous. And then COVID shut down their entire production and filming schedule. So those of us who are fans of the Grand Tour sat waiting for literally months and months and months and months, almost a year, before they finally could release the second special, A Massive Hunt, which dropped this week. And it warned my cockles, kids. Nice to see my friends again. I relied on these guys heavily. I'm thinking back to January when I was in Texas and we were staying in a hotel, three of us in one hotel room together for a month, playing some compelling shows down in the Rio Grande Valley. 
and you had time to kill in the afternoons, man. And I would watch an episode of the Grand Tour, you know, sit down with my friends, Clarkson, Hammond, and May. And I've done this a lot. I talked about talk radio as a cure for loneliness on a recent episode, equating that to podcasting and podcasts as a cure for loneliness, right? And the loneliness is rampant everywhere in the world, okay? And that's why I'm talking about this right now. Because I'm still seeing it on Facebook. I'm still hearing it from my friends. People are lonely, man. And, you know, there's lockdowns coming around here. We're just kind of waiting for the word that maybe after Christmas, we're going back into a full freaking lockdown. And that's weighing on people, man. And people are lonely and people are depressed. And I'm here to say that sometimes as a last resort, you can kind of rely on virtual friends. (laughs) I know it's not an ideal solution, man, but I've relied on virtual friends before, TV shows, AM radio that I listened to because I was lonely, just to hear other voices. And if you run across a new podcast with 200 episodes, you can make friends with that podcast, man. And you can look forward to listening to another episode and you can feel just a little bit less emotional distress listening to friendly voices, tune into a podcast that has two people talking, two regular hosts that just go back and forth, you know, and it's like you become friends with those voices. And so it was with me in the grand tour, you know, and I, I kind of blew through the whole first three seasons of their traditional show. And it's madcap stuff, man. Like I can't even describe what these guys get up to in modifying cars for different scenarios and in cars, you know, blowing up and it's lunatic stuff. And if you're not a car person, it doesn't matter. If you're just, you know, like to engage with personalities, these guys are great presenters. Their chemistry with each other is really fun to watch. And you just kind of become friends with them, man. And I got to tell you, like the specials, go and watch a massive hunt or semen or some of the other like one off one and a half hour specials they've done. Actually, even the film segments for the traditional Grand Tour show are cinematically beautiful. And they go, like, there's there's an episode where they're in, I think, Nigeria. They're driving around Africa. And just the shots, just the filmed shots of these landscapes are absolutely freaking stunning. Everywhere they go in the world, I don't know who's shooting this and what the budget is, but it's breathtaking cinematography. It really, really is. Like, if you ever watch these Planet Earth shows, you know, where they just take these majestic sweeping shots of landscapes, that's the grand tour, man. It's really breathtaking stuff. And if you're into travel shows like Tony Bourdain used to do, I miss Tony Bourdain. He was a hero of mine. You know, the Grand Tour is very much like that. You don't have to be into the cars. You can just be into the travel and just taking a look at some of the places of the world, man. And these people are lucky enough to go there and have these experiences and they share them in a really compelling, engaging and funny way. And I'm glad the Grand Tour is back. And I'm telling you, because, you know, we're coming into the holiday season. Maybe you've got a little time on your hands. And maybe we're going back into a full lockdown. You have some more time on your hands and you need something to engage with that's fun. And maybe you want to see sunshine on your TV screen. Watch the Grand Tour, all right? That's a thing you can jump onto. Don't have to be a car person, all right? I'm certainly not. But now when I see an Alfa Romeo drive by, I know what it is. So, you know, I'm recommending the Grand Tour. And I'm recommending if you're one of the lonely people, And I know you're out there because I keep hearing about it. Engage with something like that. Find digital friends. I know that sounds silly and facetious. And it ain't a cure, okay? But it can help. Find a TV show you like. Find podcasts. Find other voices to listen to. Find people to watch who make you smile. That can help. And I'm going to make a request to everybody out there, all right? If you're looking for a last-minute Christmas gift for me, I just want you to reach out to somebody, okay? If you're not one of the lonely people, just reach out to somebody you haven't talked to in a while. Text, Facebook, email, whatever. Just check in, you know? Because you don't know 
you don't know who's really suffering out there. And COVID, it's really strange because COVID has made a lot of us kind of focus on ourselves, you know, just to get through, but also focus outward as well on what's going on in the world. It's this weird mix of focus. But sometimes you forget who else is out there, especially the strong ones, man. I posted a tweet earlier this year. Make sure you check the checkers. <laughs> the people who are always checking up on everybody, check up on those people, okay? Because a lot of times they come off as being super strong and people think they don't need it. Well, sometimes they do. So just do me a favor this week, kids. Reach out to one person you haven't talked to in a while. Or someone you have talked to recently. But just reach out. And if you're one of the lonely people, don't let the loneliness make you small, okay? Loneliness can do that. Loneliness can make you depressed, obviously. It can bring you down. It can make you feel small. It can make you feel like nobody cares because there ain't nobody reaching out. But that's not the case, man. It's just people are focused on themselves because we're all trying to survive over here. So if you're one of the lonely people, reach out. Just reach out to a friend and say hi. Set up a Zoom coffee. Watch the Grand Tour. <laughs> Connect with other human beings, all right? It's important. Find online communities. But everybody, just do me a solid, all right? Do me a little Christmas solid and reach out to somebody this week, all right? Someone you haven't talked to in a while. Just say hi, because people need it. And if we go into the full lockdowns again, keep doing it. Just once a week, reach out to somebody. You don't know what a difference you can make in a person's life just by saying, hello, how you doing? You know? So do that. And if you're looking for stuff over the holidays to occupy your time, find yourself a good podcast, you know? There's podcasts out there for literally everything that could interest you. Everything from Star Wars to sexiality. It's all out there, man. And you can find a community around that and you can plug into it and you can learn a few things. You know what I'm saying? And I'm going to cut this off right here, man. I know 2020 has been diabolical. <laughs> it's been a rough freaking year, man. But some good stuff has happened. If you find yourself down in the super dumps about this weird year and you've lost things and I get it, man, I understand. Try to focus on some of the good things that happened, you know? I've had to do that. Sarah Harmer dropped a record, and that's awesome. Finally, after 10 years. Arsenal won the FA Cup, and I would have celebrated that harder than I did had I known what a freaking mess the team would devolve into after it. <laughs> we started the Music Trivia League, Ken the Zen and I. I rediscovered Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes, courtesy of the Music Trivia League and this podcast. You know, and if nothing else, you're still here, man. Sometimes I use that as a rallying cry. I'm still here. Things maybe haven't worked out the way I hoped they would, but I'm still here. Other people aren't. You know, if you're still here, hang in, man. Take that as a positive and look forward to 2021. Find things to anticipate, okay? I'm doing that. King's X is going to finally drop their new record in 2021, kids. The War on Drugs is going to drop a new record in 2021, kids. Sarah Harmer's going to tour, hopefully, in 2021, kids. And I'm going to see that with the tickets I bought. And I heard this week, I saw it on the Twitter, that they are in discussions to develop a reboot of Night Court in 2021. And if you're of a certain age, hopefully that warms your cockles, kids. Night Court with John Larroquette behind it all. Dude, 2021 looks like it might be pretty good. So if you're feeling down, find some friends, even if they're digital, even if they're virtual. Think about a couple of the good things that happened this year. Think about some of the good things you can anticipate next year. And just do your best, man, and reach out. Please do me a favor and reach out to someone, okay, this week. Just do it, all right? It never hurts to help somebody else out. I'm going to cut this off. I'm going to say thank you so much. You know, I had a rough patch in the summer, went four months without producing this show and wasn't sure I ever would produce it again. But it came back, incremental improvements, and, you know, all of you listening out there have made that possible for me, have made that doable for me, and I appreciate it. And I appreciate the feedback I've gotten. I appreciate the compliments. I appreciate you listening. I appreciate you telling other people about the show. That helps me enormously. I want to thank you. 
I want to wish you the warmest of cockles this holiday season. This is the last episode of the year for me. Got some thinking to do about what to do with this show and what direction to take with it. Incremental improvement, you know, includes a healthy dose of review, you know, and strategy. So I'm going to try to do that. I hope you're doing okay, man. Have a wonderful Christmas. Have a wonderful New Year. And I'll check you later. Thank you once again, gentle listener, for taking in today's show. If you want to know more about the program, go to www.john-huff.com. That's J-O-H-N-H-U-F-F.com and click on podcast. You can also find the show on Facebook at The John Huff Podcast. If you're an Instagram person, you can find me at JW underscore Huff. If you're a Twitter person, you can find me at at JWS Huff. No matter where you listen to the show, please do me a big, big favor and leave a rating and review. Preferably a positive one. That's all the time we have for today, but I'll be back very soon. Until then, keep your wits about you and remember... Good things happen when you put yourself out there. Bye for now. This concludes our 2020 broadcast season. Anybody got a cigarette?